All right, 5.2. I guess the idea with inverses here, just to keep in mind, is that an inverse is a function that backwardizes things. So before we get into any of that stuff, if we were to talk x's and y's or input, input and output, remember, you know, a function, if we took some function, f of x or something, and we said, e, the input of this function was 2 and the output was 5. I put in a 2, I get out a 5. Then we would know about the inverse of that function, which is that, that little negative 1 means it's just the backwards version of the function. A backward function that undoes what that inverse does, or what that function does, would be something you could put a 5 into and you would get the 2 back. So it's like it undoes everything that the original function did. And uh, a property of it is that it, it looks like what it does. I mean, what it did here is essentially what it, in general, is going to be able to, to, to do. It's a characterization. We would say, well, the x's and the y's, they switch. And so we'll keep that characterization in mind. Okay. That being the case, we'll keep those things in mind as we proceed. Check this out. I'm all trying to erase something that's not on there. It's on my screen. Oh, no, that's a period or something. I don't know. Whatever. So they say f, if f of 4 equals 8, then find f inverse of 8. But remember, all that means is here's a function. I'm putting 4 in, and I get 8 out. That's what that means. If I say f of 4 is 8, that means I put a 4 in, and I got an 8 out of it. So then they're saying, okay, what happens in f inverse then? You know. So here's f. f inverse is a function that I could put an 8 into. I could put an 8 into it, and I would get a 4 out. And so then we would just say that, I guess, is we'd say, well, f inverse of 8 then would just be 4. It's just kind of backwardizing what happened. Uh, same kind of thing here. And then uh, tricks to the trade here. OK, so we start out similar. They're saying f of 12 is 5. Then f inverse of 5 is 12. That's good. But I was looking at this. And I'm pretty sure I think I got what they had in mind here. This is a funny notation here. So what's the details on this? If we had f of 12 and then that thing inverse of that, we'd have to think through it a piece at a time. So just like when we were thinking about composite functions, because that's sort of what's going on here, we're trying to figure out, well, first off, on the inside, let's figure out what f of 12 is. And they told us that f of 12 is 5. So before I inverse anything, we're saying, oh, I know what f of 12 is. It's 5. And then they're saying, OK, give me 5 inversed, if you will. I don't think they're actually looking for 5 to the negative 1 power, because that would be 1 fifth. I should have looked up the answers. Um, yeah, I mean, you can try that if this other thing doesn't work, because that's by, no by strict notation, that's what this actually means. It's 5 to the negative 1 power. I don't know if that's what they had in mind, though. So I'm thinking that maybe it means um, the inverse value of, of 5, which would mean essentially we're just mapping this backward. Because once again, if f of 12 gives you 5, then if you took 5 and inverse functioned it, you would get yourself a 12. So they're probably thinking 12 there. It's just working backwards. When they put that negative 1, I think they're thinking inverse function um, evaluated at 5. If that doesn't work, then just put it as 1 over 5, and it'll be fine. Let me know how that goes. And then, let's see here, what else? Oh, yeah, below is a, a table for a function, f of x. They gave us this table here, and we just got to figure out which one is the inverse. And so all we got to remember about that is that the x and the y's get switched up. And so we'll just look for a table that looks like this, but all the x values, the 3, the 5, the 8, the 10, the 16, they're going to be in the y part now, and the 2, 6, 9, 11, 14 will be in the x part. And that's all. So let's see here, 3, 5, 8, 10, 16 in the y part. I'm looking, and I'm thinking that's this one. Yeah, it's got the 3, the 5, 8, the 10, the 16 in the y part, and here's the x's. That's all they're looking for there. Okay, next deal, we're playing a game here with inverses. And so if we had f of 6, we just remember how we do this. Is f of 6 means we're going to say if I'm doing... The f function, we're looking forwards, mapping x's. Hey, mapping x's into the right-hand side. This would be inputs mapping into an output on the right-hand side. But if we do f inverse, if we're ever inversing something, that means we're going to take inputs from the right and map it to the left. 
And so we'd say like f inverse of 8 equals 5 because it's mapping the y's back to the x's. And so keep that in mind because they're going to use x's for everything. And so I'm going to stop referring to x's and y's here. But just remember, when we're talking f inverse, that means I'm mapping from the outputs to the inputs. Or we're mapping from the right over to the left backwards, you know. So let's keep that in mind as we go. So here we go. First off, we got to figure out f of 6. That's not an inverse. That's just f of 6. So that means start with the 6 on the left-hand side and map it to the right. And that was a 1 until I scribbled over it. And then if f of x equals 0, then let's figure out what x is. And so if I saw something like this, I would say, well, they don't tell me f of some number. They're not saying look up some number. They're saying f of some number x that I don't know. And they gave me the answer to it. So they're not really being up front about everything. They're saying, there's some number over here, I don't know what it is. But when I mapped it across, when I mapped it over to the right, because it's not an F inverse, it's an F. When I mapped it over to the right, I got the answer zero. So we're just going to look over here. Here, we'll just look over here and see if we can figure out a number on the left-hand side. Sorry for the partial erasures a number on the left-hand side that maps over to a zero on the right. And it looks like we found one. If I put a four in, that's what gives me an equal sign of zero. So they're saying here, if f of x equals zero, then the x that got me there must have been four. So four is the one such that when I do f of that or f of four, I do get zero, which works. You know, f of four is zero maps to the right. Okay, now f inverse of one f inverse of 1, we're talking f inverse, so that's mapping from the right over to the left. And so f inverse of 1 means to find a 1 on the right-hand side and map it to the left, and we got ourselves a 6. And then finally, um, we'll just here, we'll erase a little bit. Finally, we'll say, okay, this is the trickier one of them all. The trickiest one, anyway. We'll say f inverse of, of some x value equals 4. And so we just got to remember about this. If we're talking f inverse, they're saying, remember, f inverse maps from the right to the left in this case. And so we'll say f inverse of some number I don't know, but it ends up equaling 4. And remember how that looks. We're mapping from right to the left. So we're saying take some value, some right-hand value. I don't know what I'm looking for. But I know that by the time I map it to the left, I get a 4 over there on the left. And so that's where we're like, oh, that I was looking for some value that maps out to the left to give me a 4. And I think we found it. Because now if we look carefully there, we're like, as I map over to the left, it was 0 that gave me that 4. And that's good. So then we're like, okay, I think I got what we're talking about. If f inverse of x is 4, then x must have been 0 from the right-hand side. I'm not really sure if you can see the notifications that pop up on this thing. That'd be kind of funny. I don't know what that last one was. But anyway, ta-da. Let's see what else. Oh, yeah. So now we've got to find some inverses of functions. This is where things get a little bit tougher, and so I wanted to talk to you guys about like there's there's not as much mind bending stuff like the first part you're bending your mind around what inverses are and now this part you're like doing more algebra and so here's something weird okay let f of x be x plus 8 squared they have to the first thing you're challenged to do is find a domain on which f is one to one and non-decreasing and so real quick take on that um if we were to draw this function it might be easier to understand so yeah uh, you guys might remember when we're drawing these things, x squared function is always a parabola of some kind, you know, so it'll look something like that, you know, or whatever. And so we'll expect that to happen, but you might remember new zero, negative zero, or sorry, whatever, that's an eight. Anyway, negative eight plus eight is what makes a new zero here. And so that means that's a left and right movement. So we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's where our vertex is going to happen. It's got no up and down adjustment afterwards. There's not like a number plusing out afterwards. So it's a left and right adjustment. That's just to negative 8 is the new 0. And then we get this parabola kind of going like they do up from there. That being the case, here's what they're looking for when they say 1 to 1 and non-decreasing. 
So non-decreasing is easy. That's the part where, I mean, maybe it'll be easier if I take the arrows off of it because now they both look like they're pointing up. But non-decreasing means as I go across the graph, because we read these graphs from left to right, there's part of it that's going downhill and then part that comes back uphill. Decreasing is the down part. So they want the non-decreasing part. So we're like, I'm not going to use that part. I'll use the uphill part. And then the more important part about this, which I probably should have talked about first, is the one-to-oneness of it. And so when you have a parabola, suppose we hadn't gotten rid of the left-hand side yet, a parabola essentially is it's got a mirror to it. As you guys know, across the, the axis of symmetry, we've got this mirror line, and it provides this situation where if I plug in an x that's maybe negative 5 or negative 6, I get a certain output. But there'll be another x value later on, way over here to the left, that gives me the same y value output. So this is two different x values that actually have the same y output. That doesn't mean it's not a function, but it means that it's not what we call a one-to-one -one function. And so, for that reason, we're going to choose a domain, or a part of this function. We're going to look over the whole thing and choose a part of our parabola here. That is one-to-one, -one, so I'm going to have to cut part of it out so it doesn't repeat on itself. And then they wanted the non-decreasing side. And so if we were to clean this up, essentially this is what we're looking for here, guys. We're going to be looking for redraw 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Somewhere around. I don't know. I counted wrong. We're going to be looking for essentially just at like half of this graph. So this part is going to have to go. And we, the reason we choose that part to go is because we wanted non-decreasing. We wanted the part that's going uphill, not the downhill part. So that's what we're looking at. It goes from negative 8 all the way over to forever to the right as it keeps on increasing. And so they're saying find a domain on which this thing is 1 to 1 and non-decreasing. We're going to say that goes from negative 8, probably inclusive there. Yeah, we could say non-decreasing because it's not going downhill anymore when it hits the 8 all the way out to infinity, and then parenthesize that. That's probably what they're looking for there. And then find the inverse of the restricted domain, or whatever, the inverse of this function, as long as we restrict the domain. That being the case, here we start. We get to start talking about inverses in general. And so if we were to be able to start talking about how to find inverses, remember, quick take on this would be, Instead of using f of x notation, I'll suggest that we use a y there. So y equals x plus 8 squared. And then remember about functions, or about inverses, is that if I had, you know, the x's and the y's, or some kind of an x and y chart, they get switched. And so in this function, we'd say if I plugged in a 3, then 3 plus 8 would be 11 squared. It would be 100, what, uh, 121. And so an inverse of that would be f inverse would be I could plug in a 121 and get a 3 out. The x's and the y's switch. And so if we can remember that property about them from the very beginning, that the x's and the y's switch, then finding an inverse will come very naturally. And we'll just say, I'll look into this mess. y equals x plus 8 squared. If I use the y notation, it's a little bit easier to wrap your mind around. And we'll just say, well, I'm going to switch it, you know? So that's our function as it is. And then we'll just switch it, switch it up. And then we'll put x here equals y plus 8 squared. And now even if we didn't clean it up at all, we would have a function that's an inverse of the other one, even though it's kind of not written in explicit terms there. And then once you're there, guys, just switch the x and y. That'll be an effective inverse of the function, and then we're just going to solve it out until we get y by itself again. y equals something. That's all we're going to shoot for. And so let's see here. If I wanted to get this y by itself, probably I would start by undoing the square part. And so if we were to undo the square, that would mean, let's see here, we could probably square root both sides. And so we'll square root both sides. And then we have the square and the square root will be canceling. On the left-hand side, that gives us now not an x, but a radical x, equals the y plus 8. And then we'll just get rid of that 8 like we do with a minus 8. And now we have y equals square root of x, and then take away 8. That's the inverse they're looking for. By the time you get that y by itself again, that's what we're looking for. 
It's something that has the X and Y roles switched on it. La, 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 la. Quick take. Anyway, that's what we're looking at. Square root of X, take away 8. And then other inverses happen in the same way. I am going to take you through another one that gets a little bit tougher here. So a tougher inverse would look like, say, maybe the next one. I don't know why I had to erase all of this. Anyway. So next one, we'll handle it the same way. We'll call this Y, and then we'll pull the switch. So really, we're going to put an X on the left instead of a Y. And then all these X's will be Y. So it'll be negative 4Y minus 1 over... 4y plus 5. And as this is tougher to solve, you can't get y by itself very well when there's two different y's around, and it's weird with fractions, so I wanted to take you guys through. First thing I would do is times this 4y minus 5 over to the left-hand side. And so then we'd have 4y plus, or did I, whatever I just said. Anyway, 4 plus 5, 4y plus 5, timesing with the x on the left-hand side, then we'll have equals negative 4y minus 1 left over on the right-hand side. So just timesing this thing over to the right-hand side. Technically, what you're doing is timesing both sides by it, or whatever, and then it just cancels here on the left, and then it would be left over on the right. I don't know how much that matters to you, but anyway, that's a good take on it. And then we've got to keep going until the y is by itself. It's a little bit tough to do that at this point, but maybe what we'll do, because we got two different y's, you know. Maybe what we'll do is we'll distribute through and try and get all the y terms together. So if I distribute this x in, that's 4y times x. Hey, uh, 4y times x would be a 4yx or 4xy. Plus x times 5 would be 5x. And then equals all the same stuff over here. And then maybe we'll start putting the y's together. This is a y term, and that's a y term. And so I could plus this one over. And then maybe the plus 5x, I'll even minus over to the right-hand side. So that could look something like... Let's see here, plus the 4y over here, then we'd have 4yx, and then plus 4y. And then on the right-hand side, we'd have a minus 5x and a minus 1. And then everybody that got a y in them is over here on the left-hand side. And that'll be good. Because now, we'll pull this funky trick. Check this out. Since they both have a y in them, if we were to say, like, what's the common factor? Now we've forced the issue. The common factor is y. And so we'll take the y out as a common factor from both of these terms. If we take out the common factor there, then there we have y on the outside. And then what's left is a 4x from this part. It's a 4 and an x because the y canceled out, you know. It's a 4 and an x left over plus, uh, I guess, just 4. Still equals negative 5x minus 1. We're going to have to continue this over on the, another page. And so that's y times 4x plus 4 equals minus 5x minus 1. Let's screw this over here somewhere. So y times 4x plus 4, I hope I remember that right, plus 4 equals negative 5x minus 1. And then what's cool about that is it's basically done. We're just going to get the y by itself by this stuff that's timesing with it. We'll divide it. And we'll just divide the whole thing all at once. Ba boom ba boom four looking good anyway there's different ways of doing this stuff uh there's different ways of even writing that answer if you run into trouble or you think you're doing it right and you're not getting credit for it you could always try things like i'll factor out a negative here you know it'd be like negative times 5x plus 1 and then 4x plus 4 doesn't have a negative if it did, what you could do is just factor out the negative or something and let the negatives cancel. This one doesn't have a negative on the bottom, so it really won't help. Anyway, so this is fine, too. If you don't see a bunch of negatives on both the top and the bottom, though, I would suggest probably don't worry about doing anything fancy. Just go ahead and let, let them be. And so we'll have negative 5x minus 1 over 4x plus 4. Okay, what else? Where do we leave off? That was an inverse thing. Okay. So much to say about this stuff. Okay. Oh, look at this. Look at that. Look at this. Oh, look at it. Almost there. All right. Interesting. So, almost there. Now we got something going on. Oh, yeah. 
this next one, we may not go through the whole process. It's not as big a deal, um, but it's like you got to wrap your mind around what they're asking for. They're saying F inverse of negative 3 equals something. And so let's see if we can figure this out. F inverse of something. Okay, let's remember how this goes. F maps things from X to Y. But an F inverse maps, it gives E now. And an F inverse will give you a Y value, and you've got to figure out the X. So if we have F inverse of minus 3, that's saying that negative 3 is what they're giving us. It's a Y value they're giving us, and we're going to map it back to an X value. And so what I might suggest there is that we're at this place where we normally put a Y, we'll just put negative 3 right there instead. And so it would look something like negative 3 equals x plus 2 over x plus 10. 10. And then we'll do some equation solving mess to solve it out. I'm going to let you guys figure out the rest of that except to say probably you're going to do the same thing as last time and we'll times the x plus 10 over here. So we'll end up having x plus 10 on this side and it'll cancel what uh, and it'll cancel on the other side. Why? Stop it. It'll cancel on the other side. And then hocus pocus, see if you can solve it from there. And then let's see here. Oh, yeah, I wanted to talk to you guys about this too. Find the inverse of each of the following. We've done a little bit of this kind of thing, so I just wanted to show you how it looks when we have weirder functions. So say I had this g of x one. We gotta find the inverse. They give us g of x equals seven x to the third minus five. We'll play the same game as before. We're gonna put a y here, and ooh, we'll put a y here instead of an x, and then we'll pull the switch. Or sorry, instead of a g of x, we'll pull a y there. Use the y notation for a minute. Not that you have to. And then we'll pull the switch, and we'll put x is on the left hand side equals seven y to the three minus five, and then just make that happen. And so we'll solve this out until y is by itself. You know how to get rid of a minus 5. We'll plus 5 on both sides. That's 7y3 equals x plus 5 then. And then we're just doing the things to get the y by itself. Probably like divide the 7, I guess. And then we have y to the third sitting there equals x plus 5 divided by 7. And then finally, we know how to get rid of a 3 power. We'll just do a 3 root. May have been a while since you've done that. 3 power cancels with a 3 root. Now we got the y by itself equals a big 3 root over x plus 5 divided by 7. That's what we're looking for. That's our g inverse. And so you just write this mess up here, you know, with the whole 3 root and all that. x plus 5 over, just, dang it, over, dang, what the, over 7. Junk like that going on. This one here is a fractiony function, so make sure to handle that one a little bit like we did on the fractiony function on the previous page. You might want to times the fra the bottom of the fraction over to the other side. I'd recommend so the x plus five. After you pull the switch, make sure you do the x and y switch thing. Times it over here, and that might help you to start solving this thing out. There's different ways of writing the answer for that one. All right, you win. I'll give you a quick take on it, and so. You twisted my arm, what can I say? Okay. Real quick take, though. Here's a Y. And so I'll pull the switch, and that's going to be X over on the left now equals 2 over Y plus 5. If we times this thing over to that side, then we'll have Y, oh, y plus 5 timesing with X equals 2. And then you could either distribute the X and start solving or else maybe don't even bother. It might be easier just to, at that point, say, well, I'll work from the outside in, and I won't distribute the x. I could just divide out the x if I wanted to. You could distribute it, though, if you like. It would work out, and it would just look a little different, but it'd be the same answer. And so then we have that y plus 5 is still left after the x is cancel, equals 2 over x, and then you know how to get rid of a plus 5 down there. We'll just minus the 5, minus the 5. We got x over 2 take away 5. Or else I think if you do it the other way, it's something like um, something. Or I mean 2 over x take away 5. Let's see here. It would be something like 2 minus 5x over x or something like that. Anyway. Um, Ta-da! Okay. What else we got to talk about? 
Yes. So then composing functions, once again, check this out. We have f of g of x. We've got to figure that out. And so that's the g function plugged into the f function. And this is just an interesting situation. Remember about inverses real quick before we get into that. If I had up 2, and, you know, this is an f function, it would map a 2 into a 5. But then f inverse... What it does is it maps that 5 back to the 2 and so that the 2 and the 5 switch or whatever like we keep saying. And so the behavior of these would be if I put a 2 into the f function, I would get the 5. And then if I put that 5 into the f function, I'd get the 2 back that I started with. And so we'll keep that in mind as we investigate this next thing. So watch out what happens here. If we do, oh, let's erase that too. If we're looking at f of g of x, that means g of x is plugged into f. So here's the g function. We're going to plug it into the f function. So it'll look like f. It'll be 5 times something take away 6. And this something is the g function. So x plus 6 over 5. By the time we plug that in, we're like, well, it looks like things are going to cancel because the 5's cancel. Because that was like a 5 over 1, you know? The 5's will cancel. And then all we got left here, let's back to that, it'd be x plus 6, take away 6. And plus 6, take away 6, canceled, so that's out. So all we end up getting is an x. And this is weird. And so essentially what we're saying is if I took an x in the first place, plugged it into the g function, and then plugged my answer into the f function, what I get is the same x that I started with. I'm just back to where I started. But that sure sounds like... If I had an x that mapped to a y and then right back to the same x, that means these two functions that we composed together must have been inverses of each other. The second one undid the first one and put us right back to the x that we started with. That being the case, all you got to say is this, guys. f of g of x maps right back to x. And probably that'll happen with g of f of x, too. You could try it. And then if that's the case, if that actually does happen, then we say thus g of x is called an inverse, inverse function, I-N-V-E-R-S-E, inverse function of f, because g undoes what f does and puts us right back to the x that we started with. I think that's all she wrote. Yeah, that was some other thing we did. Giddy up.